Hello, and welcome to this edition of the CSIAC podcast series. This is a multi-part series on the new Rust programming language, which was developed with the goal of being a safe systems programming language. In this series, entitled Rust Models, CSIAC subject matter expert Dr. James Fawcett will examine, explore, and describe different conceptual models that underlie the Rust programming language. In this first episode of the series, Dr. Fawcett will provide an introduction and a brief overview of the Rust programming language. In addition, he will cover the basic prerequisites required for getting started. Good morning, my name is Jim Fawcett. Uh, in this uh, video, we're going to introduce uh, the Rust programming language and some of its, or we're going to focus on some of its models. Uh, so by model, uh, we're talking about some kind of description uh, for some particularly important part that helps us understand how the language works, you know, what's going on, well, what's going to happen when we do something, uh, write a line of code uh, with the language. So. So um, this is the first in a, a short sequence of videos about Rust. And uh, this morning we're going to talk uh, primarily about getting started, you know, uh, installing stuff and doing a hello world and talking about the important features of Rust and so on. Let's start with a quick view of what Rust is, uh, what Rust models uh, we're going to talk about. So. In this sequence of videos, we're going to talk about uh, Rust type safety, uh, a model for ownership uh, of variables, uh, the ability to generate objects, um, user-defined types, generics, and uh, code structure. So uh, in this video, we're going to focus uh, on type safety and you know, getting started and just what's, right, what's Rust all about. Okay, so why Rust? <clears throat> um, Rust guarantees memory safety uh, in that uh, we're unable to uh, create dangling pointers or null references. Uh, we can't read or write to unknown memory, and uh, all of that comes about because of Rust's ownership policies. Uh, programs won't compile uh, if they're going to result in dangling pointers or uh, um, the ability to read or write to uh, uh, unknown memory. Uh, there's some cases of uh, having unknown memory that uh, Rust can't detect at compile time, but uh, the way it's designed, um, uh, should you, for example, index outside of an array, uh, then Rust does what's called a panic. It shuts down before you ever get a chance to read or write that memory. I'm going to show you in the next video after this one that uh, C++ is very happily, you know, well, happily allow you to do that. You know, well-designed C++ won't do that, but, um, you know, we'll get into those issues as we, as we move along. So uh, we get memory safety, and surprisingly, that same memory model um, uh, helps us avoid data races. When that, this is extraordinary, it's surprising that the these memory model rules for single-threaded code also um, help us write data race-free uh, code in a multi-threading environment. And uh, um, so these are unique features of the Rust programming language. And uh, that combines with um, excellent performance. Uh, Rust doesn't have, Rust uh, compiles to native code. It doesn't have a, a system of garbage collection. And so its performance is uh, as fast as C and C++. And also uh, its level of abstraction uh, is really good. It's right up there with uh, 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 C++ uh, in providing us with good ways of uh, uh, hiding, um, you know, low-level details behind, behind abstractions. So, uh, so now, uh, this video, I'm going to assume that you haven't had any ex uh, exposure to Rust, and so we're going to uh, just talk about getting started for a little bit. 
So if you go to the, um, to the Rust uh, site, rustline.org, um, you'll find a path to download uh, the Rust environment. Uh, and um, that whole process is remarkably fast. You know, in, in seven or eight minutes, you'll have uh, Rust up and running. Uh, it's easy as that. Uh, and when you install Rust, um, you get the Rust compiler and also a really nice tool called Cargo. Uh, and Cargo wraps um, the compiler and uh, has a, a bunch of other capabilities in that, you know, it serves as a package manager. It can go pull uh, resources, local resources and resources that are external and even remote resources in a really nice, convenient way. And uh, it also builds and executes code. Uh, uh, and um, the installer, by default, will put uh, cargo right on your path. So in any command window, you can pull it down and you can run, uh, you can run cargo and build code and run it and all that good stuff. Uh, I would suggest you also install Visual Studio Code. I've given you a link to do that. I'm going to use Visual Studio Code here. Uh, now, Visual Studio Code is not Visual Studio. <laughs> Okay, it's a much lighter weight, uh, uh, really it's a text editor more than anything else. It has some hooks to let you, uh, for some languages, do debugging and uh, compilation, but we're not going to do that. We're going uh, we're gonna to do all our operations in a command terminal in uh, Visual Studio Code, but, uh, and we'll just use Visual Studio Code as a text editor. So, uh, so now uh, we're ready. And so, uh, you know, if you, um, the next uh, part of the slides uh, show that, but let's, uh, let's, uh, let's pull up Visual Studio Code and let's just do it, a little tiny bit of it, you know. Uh, I'm not gonna do a lot of this because I don't wanna slow down these videos. So here we are. Uh, uh, in a directory uh, called GitHub, and I'm going to say cargo new hello. And that just created a, uh, if you look here, here's hello, and it created a source file. So uh, now, in order to run anything, I need to move Visual uh, Studio Code down into that folder. So let's just go into uh, GitHub and we'll select ho hello. And now, uh, let me pull up back to the terminal. Uh, okay, and now, so here, here we are in GitHub hello. Let's just say cargo run is building and there's hello world. So what it just did was it built this file, a little simple little file, you know, hello world, this is, uh, and <clears throat> uh, there's one other thing I wanna uh, look at, and that's cargo. Cargo is a, when I said cargo new, it built this package, and the package is really the, uh, this directory, and well, uh, Cargo Tomal has some metadata, you know, about the package, the name of the package and his version and who the author is and all that sort of stuff. And if we had dependencies, which we don't now, but if we had dependencies on external code, we would put them here. And you'll see in later videos, you'll see some evidence of all that. <clears throat> so, um, you know, so here's uh, Hello World and, you know, we can, Add a little bit just to convince you that this isn't all smoke and mirrors. So let's just change it a little bit. And now save it. And run it. And you can see now it's spaced a little differently. It you know, reacted to my changes. Uh, now what are we looking at here? So <clears throat> Fn says this is a function and here's main. So this is a normal Rust function. What we're looking at here is not a function, it's a macro. And you can tell that it's a macro because it ends in this exclamation, exclamation point. Uh, people call it a bang. So it ends with this bang. And um, the issue is that <clears throat> 
for reasons we'll talk about in later videos, um, uh, Rust functions um, aren't variadic. Uh, there's no easy way to make them variadic, but uh, there's a very well engineered macro system uh, in Rust uh, that uh, uh, makes it easy to generate macros that uh, are variadic. We'll take them, variadic means they'll take an arbitrary number of arguments. So uh, this print, println is a macro, and I can give it more uh, arguments. So uh, I could say here, for example, let's uh, do this. Oops. Now, this little squiggly is saying, hey, this isn't going to compile, but uh, let's just say let name equals uh, Jim. And now let's say hello world from, okay. So, uh, so what I've just done is I've um, created a binding of this variable name to uh, a value. And this happens to be uh, a literal string, meaning it's um, stored away somewhere in the you know, stack, in a, uh, probably in the compiler's, uh, uh, you know, where in static memory where it puts the code. And, uh, and so now it'll compile that. Now you, you notice that I got these little red squiggles uh, before I had all that put in place. And that's because uh, I have in my version of Visual Studio Code, I've included, I've installed a little helper, Rust um, uh, RLS. Uh, that's developed by the Rust uh, uh, development team for Visual Studio Code to provide IntelliSense and, uh, and uh, completion, you know, IntelliSense completion. So, and it works pretty well. Uh, it works pretty well. Uh, uh, there are some others I would recommend, at least when you begin, don't just use RLS because sometimes they conflict and stuff. So anyway, let's just, uh, let's just, now I gotta save this. Uh, you can set Visual Studio Code up so it automatically saves. I don't because every once in a while I do the wrong thing if I've got it automatically saved. But let's just say cargo run. And now it said hello world from Jim. And I could add, um, you know, let's add an, uh, from Jim just to show you that I uh, can take a variadic number of arguments. Uh, I'm going to say, comma, quote, okay, and uh, file save all, and okay, and now, you know, this is a, a again, a, a literal string. And I could have named it and passed it in as an argument, but I'm, you know, I'm passing this in as an argument. This literal string has gone here. This name referring to this literal string has gone here. So you can, you know, that's the way it works. So uh, I'm going to stop with Visual Studio Code because this is taking too long. Let's I go back to the um, go back to the. Uh, uh, slide presentation. And so, you know, this is what we looked at. Uh, and, you know, again, that's what we looked at. And um, so here, here's the cargo file, you know, with the metadata and all that sort of stuff. And here's me building it. And uh, here I added a different function, helper. Uh, and um, this is a reference. So we're not going to talk a whole lot about that today. But, uh, uh, you know, in this video, but in the next video, we're going to talk a lot about the references. But anyway, I wrote a little uh, helper function, and here it is. And in the next uh, slide, I'm going to create an object. Now, you know, 
this is just kind of a preview snapshot. There's a lot to talk about before we, you know, you really understand how all this works. But um, Rust treats structs the way C++ treats classes. Uh, I can have data members in a struct. I can add functions to a struct. I can inherit from something called traits, you know, lots of good stuff. So here I have a helper um, uh, that um, struct that has a uh, string variable whose name is s, and uh, I can create methods for it, function set string. And again, you know, I'm going to be explaining all this stuff. This is just kind of a preview to a mind setting. You can, you can, so you can tell where we're going to go. Uh, we'll wait to the next video before we explain, uh, you know, a lot about what's going on. But anyway, you know, so here I'm, I'm let, uh, I'm creating an instance of this helper, and I say h dot set string. I'm calling a method on that helper. So this is an object. Okay, just you know, same model as a C plus plus object, implemented differently, but the same idea as a C plus plus object. And now I can say print h dot get string and you know so cool so why rust so uh rust provides uh memory safety i, you know, I haven't really demonstrated that but all of that's uh uh coming up uh we're going to talk a little bit about it um in the next slide uh so it provides memory safety freedom from data races good performance and you've begun to get a flavor for the abstraction, you know, nice function and object abstractions, just like, you know, um, uh, all the modern languages. So uh, type safety. So type safety is a, is a model. Uh, program is well-defined if no execution can exhibit undefined behavior. And uh, I'm gonna, show you a little snatch of undefined behavior in, in C++ in just a minute. You can't get that in Rust because of its memory model. A language is type safe if its type system ensures that every program is well defined, and that's Rust is type safe. <clears throat> a non-type safe language may introduce undefined behavior with integer overflow, buffer overflows, um, use after free, double free, race conditions, you know, all those kinds of things that uh, malware likes to exploit, you know, you can't get in Rust. Okay, so here's an example of undefined behavior. Um, uh, the, uh, there's a sequence of demos uh, that uh, I'll point to you in the next video. Uh, and in that sequence of demos, there's a couple of C++ demos. This is one of them. I'm demonstrating uh, undefined behavior. <clears throat> so what I've got here is I have, uh, so I'm assuming that you know a little bit about C++. So uh, I have a vector, just a vector of integers uh, named V. So I've created it, it's now empty. Now I set its capacity to three, reserve. So that will hold three things without reallocating. So um, a vector is like a, a, a buffer that manages its own internal memory. If you try to add another item, push back another item uh, when its capacity is already full, it silently goes away, allocates new memory off, you know, in someplace else, copies everything over, you know, and you, you, you know, it's a sign on operator. It's just like it has infinite memory. That's the good news. And the bad news is it silently goes away and does that stuff. Um, uh, here, I push back, push back, push back. And so now I have reserved, uh, I've filled up that entire capacity. And I create the, uh, I, I take the address of V1 and uh, I take the address of um, R1. Now, this is a, C++ reference to the second item of the vector. Remember that we count starting from zero with vectors. So uh, this is a reference to the second item in that vector whose value uh, is one. And so I have the address of that location. 
uh, address of R1 uh, to show you that they're the same. The value of R1 should be two, one, two, three, because here's the two. And uh, so here it is, capacity V is three, one, two, three. That's uh, when I uh, showed the vector as a function. I'm not showing you here, but it's really simple. And here's the address of V1 and R1. They point to the same thing, okay? And the value of R1 is two. It's just a second element of this vector. And now I do a pushback and it didn't blow up. It just silently went away and allocated new memory. Okay, that caused reallocation, one, two, three, four. Address of V1, so here I'm taking the address of V1 and that's some same number. Address of R1, okay, is, uh, is uh, the old address, not the new one. It's the old one. So it's holding on to that old one. And now when I take its value, it's some garbage number, okay? I have read from memory that I don't own. And I could have written to it just as easily. Undefined behavior. Here's another aspect of undefined behavior. It's just a second part of the same program. I've created an array, okay? And now I, uh, uh, an array of three elements, and now I'm indexing from zero to three. Notice the equal sign. So I'm indexing one off the end of the array. Now the compiler's warning me, okay? but I can do it, okay? And so uh, I did it, okay? And now, I, you know, I'm just printing them out. One, two, three, garbage. So I'm reading garbage. And again, I could have written to that. And notice it exited, uh, you know, normal ex exit. Now, in all fairness, you know, uh, C++ has conventions that avoid all that. You know, if I had used an iterator in that first part, you know, back up here, if I'd used an iterator rather than a C++ reference, okay, uh, when I push back four, this is an invalid iterator, and as soon as I try to dereference that to get that value, it throws an exception, so I don't get undefined behavior. You know, it doesn't... Uh, give me a value, but that's the good thing because it's it, I don't own that memory, so it shouldn't give me a value. So it's an exception. So C plus plus, and the same thing for you know for that uh, loop. If I use an, um, uh, a range based for, I'll never index it out of bounds. Okay, so C plus plus by convention has these nice ways of avo avoiding that undefined behavior. The real issue here is that. Uh, that uh, in a large system, you know, if I've got three million lines of code, and that's not large, you know, the Linux kernel is 20 million lines of code or 30 million lines of code or something like that. And Windows is like 60 million or so. So, you know, three million lines of code is a modest sized system. And when you're writing uh, a system that large in C++, it's extraordinarily difficult not to have one or two or three or four slips that uh, generate that kind of undefined behavior, okay? Because you're doing this by convention. With Rust, it's done by construction. You can't have those undefined behavior. It's designed not to let that ever happen. You're going to spend more time, a little more time with the compiler because the compiler is going to natter at you when you do those sort of things. You know, it's just not going to warn you. It's not going to, it's not going to compile. Okay. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to stop uh, this video. This is the end of this video. And the next video in the sequence, we're going to be talking about um, Rust ownership, the basis for the kinds of things we've been talking about this morning. So uh, with that, I'll say uh, goodbye. On behalf of the CSIAC, we would like to thank you for viewing this podcast. We hope you found the content useful and informative. If you would like to provide us with feedback, please comment on this video or visit our website at www.csiac.org 
where you can also find additional content to review. Thank you. Did you know that CSIEC offers free monthly webinars featuring experts in the areas of cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management? Come see leading industry professionals talk about industry practices and leading research. Make sure to visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars in order to subscribe to our mailing list and see when the next webinar series is available. There you can also watch previous webinar series to catch up. Visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars.